Good morning, everyone. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you all for coming. They told me the room is set up for 120 chairs, and there's at least 20 people in the back. So uh, I'm just overwhelmed that uh, so many people got my email. <laughs> it's great. How many came because they saw the little blurb in the club newspaper this week? Or new people this week? Oh, wow. Great, great, great. Thank you for coming. In the back, there's a piece of paper. If you'd like to be on the email list, write your email down there and your name, and I will add you to the list. You get uh, basically about one email a week, which tells you what the meeting is going to be that week, or if there's not going to be a meeting that week. Like at the end of March, we actually have uh, a fifth Sunday, and the, the fourth Sunday, we're not going to have so uh, it's important to know that. Um, I'd like to ask everyone to please set your cell phone to whisper. We don't have many, you know, Michael Jackson songs coming in the middle of March talk or anything else interesting. Um, so all of you folks who are new today, I hereby induct you into the Humanist Club. You are now fully pledged members of the Humanist Club. Thank you very much. Uh, our club email list currently has over 860 names on it. Uh, and we share that with the Free Thinkers Club. So uh, uh, my name's Jim Laurent. I forgot to say that. Jim Laurent, I'm a member of the board of the two clubs, the Humanists and the Free Thinkers. We share a single email list. We have a board of eight members that set up, uh, manage the volunteer work, uh, the schedule, the interface with the rec department, and so forth. Um, if you have a topic that you are interested in hearing or that you would like to speak about, please come to a board member and talk to us. We can try and put you on the schedule. I'm currently scheduling into September, so we're actually fully booked uh, through uh, August. I'm scheduling into September, but we can work with you. We can help you put together a topic, a presentation, slides, whatever. This club meets three times a month, the first, second, and third Sundays. And on the second Sunday, which is next week, I'll tell you a little bit about that momentarily, we have what's called Social Sunday, where we have a, a mini talk, like a five or 10 or 15 minute talk, followed by small group discussion. So it gives you a time to you know, get to know some of the members a little bit more. But uh, I see you have our piece of paper there. And uh, all that information is on there. I was just going to discuss that. Uh, oh, I'd like to thank the coffee and snack team, Pam, and, and it works with the folks back there. Make sure we have a few little snacks. We may have to increase the snack budget, Pam. I don't know. With all these people showing up. Um, in the back, aside from the email sign-up list, you will see this handy piece of paper. It's two-sided. It's an amazing for you to do that. On one side, you'll find information about the Humanist Club. On the other side, you'll find about the Free Thinkers Club. Uh, pick this up. Memorize it. Then swallow it. Next time you are at the tea box or at a driveway party and someone asks you, well, what do you do in the villages? Say, oh. I go to the Humanist Club. <laughs> you know what the next thing they're going to say is? <laughs> What's a humanist? I got you a cheat sheet right here. Read it, memorize it. Don't be astounded. Also, I found this uh, the other day. The Ten Commitments of Humanism. So you can pick that up, look at that, stick it on the refrigerator, because that's a good place for it. Uh, so, as I said, next week we will be having a meeting. Uh, it will be a social Sunday meeting. It will be right here at 10 o'clock. And Pam Cresswell and Peter Irwin will be running it. And Peter, uh, where's Peter? Tell us about your topic, Peter. Nice and loud. All right, nice and loud. It's going to be a 
going to be about female poets, and uh, we'll discuss a couple of poems by female poets, and uh, the general topic will be love gained and love lost. scuba diving with my brother down in uh, West Palm, so I'm yeah. sorry I'm going to miss that one. You will be more. Yes. I'm going to miss that one. Uh, where's Bud? Bud. Uh, first, tell us what's going on next week, and then you have another. Okay. Uh, I, I run the Free Thinkers Club. Um, next week, we're going to have Mark Walton again. Uh, he's going to be uh, speaking uh, at Churchill Recreation Center, uh, that's in a week and a half, uh, Thursday and 14th uh, at 3.30. And his topic is War and Peace in the Middle East. Uh, Nothing controversial. <laughs> no, Mark never does, does anything controversial. Um, so that, that's what's coming up next for us. Um, I also have, uh, I want to take a little bit of a poll. Uh, one of the problems we've been having is uh, sometimes we have an overflowing crowd. Not as, not as much overflowing as this one, but uh, we've got Mark coming next, and he always brings in uh, a, a crowd, so we'll probably, if, if, if you're thinking about coming, please do, but uh, he's gonna be repeating it uh, in May at the Free Thinkers Club South. So uh, if you're worried about getting a seat, uh, you can come in the South uh, in May at Aviary Rec Center instead. Uh, the announcement I wanted to make, be because we've had problems uh, with overflowing crowd, uh, the, the uh, people at the Rec Center administration have offered us an alternative uh, location, uh, which is at Bridgeport uh, Recreation Center. It's uh, right, uh, right across the circle, right where Arnold Palmer is. So it's right on the main drag. Um, and it's at 2.30 instead of our normal time at 3.30. So I wanted to get just a feel for how how many people here would uh, approve of getting a larger place, and that's that's certainly a more uh, convenient place as well, but it's a different time. So, uh, how how many people would would prefer the new place? Bridge, so, that's, Bridge at, that's Bridgeport at two thirty. Okay, thank you. And, and how many people would definitely not prefer the new place? I would be interested in what they are in their history. Okay. And, and that, that's the kind of problem when you change the time. Uh, people who, the time that you now have uh, works for them can come. And there might be some, there's always going to be some people who have other plans at whatever your new time is. Uh, but it looks like the majority clearly uh, would prefer. Uh, the but I do the second question. How many would not prefer that one? There were some hands that went up. You didn't. You were, yeah. Were, yeah. He saw. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, we can, we can take that again. How many people would not want the new the new place? Yeah. About ten. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm going to take the same kind of poll at uh, the next meeting of the Free Thinkers, um, and then we'll announce our, our decision. Thank you. Thank you, Bud. All right, I'm very excited to have Mark uh, okay. here today because the, the change would be in April, not not for this meeting. Oh, okay. Uh, excited because in this critical race theory, we hear a lot about it in politics, and there's just 
so much misunderstanding of what it is, what it isn't, what it's being used for, what it's not being used for, and so forth. So uh, Dr. Welch has uh, served as a judge advocate general in the military and a professor at West Point Academy. Before he goes so, I do have a little quote I'd like to start off with. This is from Charles Dickens. No one is useless in this world who lightens the burden of it to anyone else. So today after you go out, I'd like to see you, you know, think this week of lightening someone else's burden so that you're not useless. <laughs> All right, Mark? Give a big hand for Mark Welch. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, I had 72 slides, but since people are standing back, I've cut it down to nine. So we will have nine slides. Um, I know some of you. Um, I'm Mark Welton. Um, very brief, brief background. Uh, I went to Stanford University as an undergraduate. Masters in International Relations from Boston University, JD from Georgetown University Law School, Masters of Law from the University of Virginia Law School, and my doctorate in international law from the University of Virginia Law School. I was an active duty judge advocate for 22 years. I was chief of international law for the Army in Europe, legal advisor at the American Embassy in Bonn, and deputy legal advisor at the US European Command. When I retired from the Army, I taught as a civilian professor at West Point, taught international and comparative law, jurisprudence and legal theory, and what every cadet has to take, so every professor in the law department teaches it, constitutional law. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, a condensation from my course that I directed and taught on jurisprudence and legal theory to cadets, most of whom were legal studies majors. And this is kind of a condensation of a part of that course. I'm going to start out with theory. This is going to sound philosophical and theoretical. We'll boil it down to things like feminist jurisprudence and critical race theory, but it's an introduction. I'm not going to advocate because I don't advocate, although I'm a former judge advocate. Uh, I teach. So I'm going to present what critical theory is, critical race theory, and so forth and give you a background and a basis so when you hear about critical race theory or feminist jurisprudence or things like that, you'll have a background. So there's going to be some philosophy and some theory because this is critical theory, so it's going to sound a little theoretical. But we've got nine slides. I won't spend too long on them, and we'll have, I think, hopefully, plenty of time for some questions. OK, again, I'm going to start at the high level of theory and work our way down. <clears throat> sort of modern thought, or thought if you're a philosopher, can be kind of boiled down to pre-modern, modern, and post-modern post thought. Um, if you are a pre-modernist, or you're thinking in pre-modern terms, pre-modernism, and again, this is oversimplification, focuses on the natural order of things. Pre-modern thought says there's a natural order of things. God, nature, man, all work together, and basically things stay sort of the same. That's kind of the way pre-modernists thought through much of history. If you're a modernist, and modernism really came around in Europe with the Enlightenment and other areas of the world later on, the, the context of modern thought is progress that mankind, humankind, slowly progresses. There's ups and downs, but it's the idea of progression. And this came about with the development of scientific thought, that science can lead to increasing improvements in people's lives, and things will eventually get better. And uh, yes, nature's out there, but through science and endeavor, humans can conquer nature and increase the quality of their life and better the world. That's the, the essence of modern thought. Postmodern thought, which is more or less of a 20th century phenomena, says no, that's not true. There's no meta-narrative. And a meta-narrative is simply 
an explanation for how the world works. Uh, inevitable progress would be the meta-narrative of modern thought. Postmodern thought says no, there's no meta-narrative, that the world just goes up and down, things get better, then they get worse, and a lot of things depend upon who you are, your perspective on things, where you live in the world, whether you're a male, male or female, what race you are, your age, uh, all those sorts of things. So I'm gonna explore postmodern thought now just a little bit more, because critical theory and critical race theory is postmodern. Okay, so again, these concepts of pre-modern, modern, and postmodern thought are intellectual trends. Most people go through lives and they don't constantly wake up in the morning saying, oh good, I'm a postmodernist. Uh, that's not how it works. But these are intellectual trends. And they kind of reflect the makeup of a culture and society. Different cultures and different societies may be in, to some degree pre-modern, to some degree modern, to some degree postmodern. We're all familiar with postmodernism in art. Well, art reflects these trends. Pre-modern, modern, which is very realistic, postmodern thought, which is what you see, it, well, what it is, is depend on how you interpret it, and you might interpret it differently than you, and there's no meta narrative, there's no single way to look at something. And this is true in economics, it's true in politics, it's certainly true in law. Postmodern thought says a lot depends on who you are, how you look at things, not that there's some universal truth. Postmodern, modern, and po uh, premodern thought can also coexist in societies. I'm going to talk about Iran a little bit later. Uh, there's no society that is 100% modern, premodern, postmodern. These again are trends. Okay, let's narrow it down a little bit more. Postmodern thought, <laughs> this sounds awful wonky. Postmodern, modern undermining of the meta narratives of pre modernity and modernity. <laughs> that's, I love that. Um, in fact, that's how I started my first lecture to the cadets on this particular course. What that means simply is postmodernism says, no, there's no meta-narrative. Humankind and the world does not inevitably progress. There's no universal truth. There are some things that are more true than others. This is not nihilism, where everything is relative. But a lot depends upon who you are. And the idea of modernism, remember, was in sort of inevitable progress with science and technology that with ups and downs, eventually will make life better and better. Well, the 20th century kind of disproved much of that. We had science, and the Nazi regime took science, and they dedicated science to the Holocaust. That's not progress. Um, the idea of total war is based on science. Human ingenuity resulted in unbelievable destructions of the First and Second World Wars. The second thing that happens in the 20th century is just the complete overwhelming growth of scientific knowledge, communications, artificial intelligence. What do we know now? How, how do we know what's true? There is so much information coming at us and so much new knowledge. And what is AI going to do with, with humankind? that it's just hard for us to grasp all that. So the idea that humans can control things and make life better and better through, and this is modernism, is just false. The world is moving much too fast. And the third thing we have in the 20th century, much more so than preceding, this intermingling and exchange of people and cultures, traveling, immigration, we're not isolated anymore. <clears throat> Asians don't stay in Asia, Africans don't stay in Africa. We move around and we're exposed to so many different people and types of information and so forth, it's confusing. So, so to wrap up this kind of introduction then, what are the basic tenets of postmodern thought? No grand meta-narratives. 
There's no such thing as inevitable progress. We can progress in some areas, but we can slide backwards in other areas. The idea of postmodernism is that there's no foundational knowledge. It rejects premodernism. Uh, most modern, most postmodernists are not uh, deeply religious necessarily. They could be, but generally not because there's no, again, certainty in these revealed truths. Um, we evaluate the world through our own personal backgrounds and prejudices. And this is, these two are critical. Postmodernists say the world's not binary. Modern, pre-modern, particularly in modern thought, would say people think in binary terms. You're white or you're black. You're male or you're female. You're old or you're young. You're American or you're not American. Uh, things are black and white. This is right. This is wrong. Postmodernist says, no, there's lots and lots of gray areas in between. Again, it's not rejecting any kind of certainty. Um, most people would agree that uh, the Nazi philosophy was an evil philosophy. But for most things, you know, there's lots and lots of gray areas. So the world is not binary. And what's happening is we realize more and more the world is just full of paradoxes. And the third thing, third tenet, is that in political life and in social life and in economic life, the central key concept is power. Who has power and who exercises it? That's how the world has operated since the beginning. That's how it operates now. Look to see who has power how that power is kept and exercises. And that power is centralized. Those who have power inevitably want to keep power. And out groups, and that I've underlined that term, that's critical to postmodern thinking, is that out groups, those who don't have power, are kept out of power. And finally, I had to put my pictures of Madonna in. When I taught, most cadets knew who Madonna is. If I were to go back now, I'm not sure many of them know who Madonna is. Madonna is the essence of postmodernism. Who is Madonna? What kind of singer was she? Was she a Puritan? Was she modern, 1940s? Was she scholarly? Was she a vamp? She constantly changed her persona. If you've ever followed her career, you wouldn't know who's going to come on stage. Her outfits were sometimes sedate, sometimes outlandish. She constantly changed herself. That's called skimming the surface. You're constantly changing. That's kind of a symbol, if you will, of postmodernism. But it's those bottom two things that are, that are critical. OK, so given this idea of pre-modern, modern, and postmodern thought, What's critical theory? Critical theory is postmodern theory. It comes out of postmodern thought. And it requires, I'm going to sort of read this a little bit, it requires consideration of different perspectives, recognizing the limits of our own views that are culturally embedded in our own personal attributes. Postmodernists believe that the way you and the way you and the way you look at the world is not purely objective. It depends to a great extent on how old you are, how young you are, whether you're male, whether you're female, whether you're black, Asian, Hispanic, white, rich, poor, American, Ecuadorian. All of these things tinge the way you look at the world. You can't escape it. You can recognize it but you can't really ex escape, it, escape it. That is determinative to a great deal on how you look at the world. Critical theory then says, we take, we take texts, uh, T-E-X-T-S. Texts are written texts, they're the stories we hear, the way we think, these are texts, and the way we 
have to look at the world is to deconstruct those texts. And again, this sounds awfully theoretical, but deconstructing texts simply means you look beneath the lines, you look behind the words. And I'm going to give you some examples in just a few moments. And how texts are used, understood, and interpreted depends on the verse. If you read a story, you sometimes put yourself into that story and say, I can sort of identify with the character. Well, how do you envision that character? Does that character look like you? Does that character not look like you? Is that character somewhat similar to you or very, very different? And then finally, again, to repeat, the idea of power and the preservation of power is central to the way that the world works. OK. Now we're going to get closer and closer to critical theory, critical legal theory, and critical race theory. Critical theory in the law really was a trend that quite specifically came out of the University of Wisconsin, <coughs> Wisconsin Law School in the 1970s. There was a movement in that law school called critical legal studies. And what it does is takes the tenets of critical theory, postmodernism, and applies it to how the law works in practical terms. It rejects the idea of neutral principles in the law. And I'm going to give you some examples in just a moment. But what it essentially says is legal texts, and those can be statutes, decisions, how a judge decides a case, those are all texts. They reflect the racial, cultural, gender, wealth, dot, 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 attributes of those who write the text, legislators, interpret the text, judges, attorneys, clerics, if you're in a religious legal system, whoever has the authority to make decisions and write these laws, those reflect the attributes of those particular people who hold power. The two great offshoots of this are feminist jurisprudence and critical race theory. Critical race theory comes right out of this. And you can't understand critical race theory. It's not just a political thing. It comes out of this trend of postmodern intellectual thought. So let's look at those two things, with the feminist jurisprudence and then critical race theory. Remember, power is essential. That's a key concept of critical theory. Well, who has power in most societies? <laughs> Men. That's the patriarchy. Okay? In some places more so, in some places less so. But it's there. It's a system of society or government in which men hold the power. And women, remember the, the catchphrase outgroup? Well, in a patriarchy, women are the outgroup. Reflecting postmodernism, remember deconstruction of texts. What a, post, what a uh, feminist would do, a feminist scholar would do, is expose the inherent bias, power bias, bias against women. Example, U.S. rape law. For many, many years, for a long time, U.S. rape law requires if you want to convict somebody of a rape in court, you have to show that there was lack of consent to the act and that there was force involved, those two things were essential to prove. Well, a neutral principle of law would say, okay, how do you show lack of consent? Well, you have to put the woman on, on the stand. And if what judges would do, and there are countless cases that demonstrate this, if there's no evidence of physical resistance to the act, the courts would assume consent. They have to, you have to prove lack of consent by showing that the woman physically resisted. Various ways to do that might be hard to do that. What a postmodernist would do would be con deconstruct those cases and say, what's really behind them? Well, who has generally more physical strength in general, men or women? It was proven or demonstrated, again, by looking behind this, that Statistically, when a woman physically resisted, she was statistically much more likely to be killed or physically, really physically harmed other than the rape. 
if she resisted. So it would be better for a woman if she was in an in a inescapable situation not to resist with force because the violence against her would be increased. So what happened was, a uh, critical theorist would say, you've got to change this rape law. You can't put the woman on the stand and assume that to demonstrate lack of consent, she must show or have physically resisted. That's behind this neutral principle that sounds, okay, lack of consent, but that's really what's going on underneath the surface. So like critical theory, suppression of women who lack power in society is reflected in the language and, in, and the interpretation of the patriarchy. Again, today, in some societies, more or less, in some societies, it's different. my wife's computer. <laughs> Thank you. You've been listening. I appreciate it. That's, that's very good. There we go. There we go. Okay. Well, this was advertised as a talk on critical race theory. Okay. It was critical race theory. Critical race theory is postmodern. Critical race theory develops from the idea of power. Who has power in a society? Generally the dominant race. Now, this is not just an American phenomenon. This is across the world, where people who have a dominant race tend to suppress or keep out of power those who have, are of a different race. That is simply objectively, according to postmodern theory, true. So, Critical race theory simply recognizes that if you are of a minority race, you lack power, generally speaking, and you are an outgroup, and those who have power will continue to suppress you in various ways to keep from sharing power. So what critical race theory says is how do we approach that? How do we rectify that? How do we address that? Well, in critical theory, remember, Critical theory says there's no meta narrative. You can explain that the US Constitution says in the 14th Amendment, every person shall enjoy equal protection of the laws. Well, that's, that's a flat out statement. Is that how it really works in practice? The answer is not really, not all the time, certainly. So rather than try to give some sort of general explanation or pass a law that says everybody should be treated equally, a critical race theorist would say, we need to tell people stories, individual stories, and enlighten people that how the law really works, how, how a minority is truly, in practice, affected. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, although it was 19th century, is a great example of that. Uncle Tom's Cabin exposed the truth of what slavery did to people to a lot of people who were unaware of it and really had quite an effect uh, in changing attitudes toward slavery in the South during that era. If you tell enough narratives and you, and you tell stories, eventually you explain or you reveal a pattern of underlying structures in the law, in society, that underlie racism and that are embedded in, again, texts. Example, the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment guarantees every person equal protection of the laws, plus due process and some other things. Well, is that sufficient? Does that give minority races equal power? And we know it doesn't, because in the political system, you can get around that by gerrymandering. You all know what gerrymandering is. We draw in districts to make sure that your party or your race or whatever it is, is, get, is more or less guaranteed to stay in office. Um, the political question doctrine. The political question doctrine is something that the Supreme Court uses to not hear a case. They will not hear a case if they deem that 
the issues in the case are, quote, really more political than legal and should be left up to the political bodies, Congress, the legislature, to decide. Well, a critical race theorist would say that the reason that the Supreme Court has not outlawed gerrymandering or declared it to be unconstitutional is they want to preserve the power of those people on the Supreme Court, which until recently was predominantly male and white. In fact, remember I said in 19, 1970s at the University of Wisconsin, excuse me, Wisconsin, uh, that's sort of where this started. Uh, in the Great Hall, and I did not go to that school, but in one of the large lecture rooms, they had portraits of all of the deans of the law school up until the 1970s. Guess what every picture showed? <laughs> Old, white, males, okay? So, in the Supreme Court, until fairly recently, old, white, males. Um, so the idea of a critical theorist, and this is critical race theory, is you've got to look behind the words of the Constitution, the words of the text, and see how this really works in practice. And the responses to this can vary. Uh, it, uh, you can deny that this is in fact the case. The Loving versus Virginia case, which we taught in our constitutional law class, the Lovings were a black and white couple. Uh, uh, white man married a black woman in Virginia. In, this is 1960s. If you did that in Virginia, it was a felony. 10 years in prison to marry somebody of a different race. So they had to go to Maryland to get married because it was illegal in Virginia. When they came back to Virginia, they were arrested and put in jail. They appealed, it went to the Supreme Court. The argument of the state of Virginia was twofold. One was pre-modern. God put the, and this is in, the, in their brief, in their text, in their argument. God put the races on different continents, therefore it is supreme law, God's law, that the races not be mixed. You can read it, that was the argument. The Supreme Court rejected. The second argument was, this is not discrimination under the Constitution, because who are we putting in jail? The black person and the white person, so we're treating them equally. <laughs> and that, honestly, is the, was the argument. Supreme Court rejected that argument. Underlying that was, of course, the idea of segregation. Another response can be guilt for the repression of minorities. This is the idea of reparations. And there are a lot of arguments about reparations and so forth. The idea of reparations is our, or our past generations were guilty, and to rectify this, reparations are appropriate. I'm not going to argue that, but it, that's an argument. And finally, responsibility for the future. Um, I lived and worked in Germany for 14 years, and in Germany, after the Second World War, German high school students would be taken, this was a requirement, to some of the concentration camps and tour, the, uh, tour through the concentration camps. <clears throat> and I was giving this lecture or this talk a couple months ago, and the woman said, that's horrible, because you're making these kids feel guilty for something <clears throat> that they did not do. Well, the response, overwhelmingly from German kids, and I got this from all of the German professors and so forth that I uh, talked to, was we don't feel guilty because we didn't do it. What it taught us is we're responsible for making sure it doesn't happen again. And if you go to Germany and see some of, for instance, the neo-Nazi marches, what is the response? Huge crowds coming and rejecting that kind of ideology. So you can approach this, pat these wrongs in different ways, denial, guilt, or simply acknowledging and taking responsibility for, for the future. Okay, last slide. So that's critical race theory. That's what it is. 
It comes out of postmodernism. It comes out of, it doesn't require a particular response. It just simply requires, if you're a postmodernist and a critical theorist, that you recognize what's really going on underneath the surface of these apparently uh, nice laws and texts and so forth, and really what's under, under the surface. So, movement from postmodernism through modernism, and post it creates social conflict. There's no society that is truly one or the other. Uh, one of my specialties, I teach Islamic law and Islamic theory, and I sort of specialize in Iran, because I have family members there. Um, Iran is a real contrast between a society that, in some respects, is very pre-modern, in other respects, very modern, and moving into postmodernism. Um, it is the sixth most internet wire country in the world. 90% of Iranians own cell phones and use them. The majority of university were, uh, students in Iran are women. And yet you have a religious government that imposes the hijab clothing on women and excludes them from being judges and other political office. That's patriarchy to a high degree, and yet it's a very postmodern, wired, intelligent society. And you can understand the conflicts in that country as part of this conflict between postmodern, modern, and pre-modern thought. Societies are built on power structures and the preservation of power among elites. That's a tenet of critical theory. Exclusion of outgroups, and that can be racial, religious, gender, and it's not just, again, this is worldwide, that are marginalized within the power structures of society. Postmodern thought says we have to recognize that. And once we recognize it, then we can take appropriate measures, however that might be. And finally, it says you've got to look at the language and texts and reject binaries. You know, the world is not black and white. It's not all good and not bad. Some are better than others. You can say Mussolini made the trains run on time. Well, that's good. But it pales in comparison to everything else he did. So it's not nihilism, but understanding that gray areas exist and you have to look at how text and language is used in practice. That's critical theory. That's critical race theory. That's where it comes from. That's feminist jurisprudence. So we've started from high, high level theory down to what has become a politicized issue critical race theory that is being used, in my opinion, wrongfully, inappropriately, wildly, and uh, hopefully this will give you a little bit of a basis to understand what's really at issue here. So, thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was great. And uh, now's the time where you get to ask Questions. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'll pick on someone. If I pick on you, please stand up so we can see who's talking in this giant room. Ask your question as if you're being charged by the word. Please. <laughs> if you're comfortable, tell us your name and your village so we, we get to know you. And because I have the microphone, I get the first question. What would a critical theorist comment about the recent uh, Alabama Supreme Court ruling that invoked, where the Chief Justice invoked the possible wrath of God if we make the wrong decision? <laughs> See, this is why I like simple subjects. <laughs> it's easy. Well, I think everybody here can answer that. If a decision invokes the wrath of God, is that pre-modern, modern, or post-modern? Pre-modern. Okay. Is it bad to be pre-modern? No. There's no bad or good, remember? No binaries. It's not all bad and it's not all good. It depends. A, a post-modernist can be religious. Okay. It depends how they structure their religion or if they want to. 
um, but it's how you use it. So, to invoke the wrath of God for a decision of a legislator is, in my opinion, both pre-modern and it does not understand how the word world really works. It's the, if you look underneath that, what is it really saying? We're maintaining the status quo, we're maintaining the power, okay? We're just invoking God or nature or whatever to justify it. That's what's going on. And that's to me is why post understanding postmodernism on is useful. It's a tool that helps you understand what is really going on. Mark, thank you again for one of your great talks and for giving us a context in which to think about uh, the uh, critical theory. A question, however, about the generalization about law. Uh, I'm wondering, first of all, we all understand that much of thinking uh, is tribal. And so we uh, identify with the tribe that we're in and when we talk about power, it's tribal thinking rather than power. The question is in general, are, uh, I think of uh, procedural law. In what sense does power play a role in procedural law? It seems that uh, there are procedures such as requiring seat belts that don't respond to power, they respond to a uh, problem in society, and that many of the laws we make are approximations for solving the problem, and when we find that the law doesn't work because there are specific elements of the law or cases in which the law doesn't cover very well, then we modify the law in order to take into account the situations which the law doesn't work. And I'm not sure I quite understand your generalization that all law has uh, to do with power rather than problem solving. Peter's going to get a big bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Uh, in 15 seconds. Um, Judges have to make laws, legislatures have to write laws for public safety, for whatever reason. None of this says you can't do that. You have to do that. You know, I, I teach, when I teach law, I teach comparative law, for instance, how the legal systems of the world originate and how they work. Um, all this is saying is, if I'm a judge, or I'm a legislator, okay, I'm deciding a case, what does this require? This requires, not that I can't decide because I'm inevitably going to decide to maintain my power. Just to recognize I'm a white, older, male American. That, to some extent, affects the way I think. If I recognize that, then I can deal with it and understand it and ensure that my decision is based to the best of my ability on more of a neutral, a fair approach and to recognize where maybe my biases, and we all have them, to try to minimize them as much as possible. Legislature, sh legislator should do the same thing. I, the the seatbelt law is a neutral law, okay? Just pretty clear. But there are other laws, like in gerrymandering and so forth, that are expressly designed to maintain power for certain groups. It's, what this teaches us is recognize that that's happening where it happens. Doesn't mean you can't pass laws if it, that I can't decide a case I just need to recognize what's going on and ensure that that does not unduly tinge my decision as a judge or my law as a legislator. Well, thank you again very much, Mark. That's a great talk. I'm Bo Goldsmith uh, from Pine Hill. And one of the things that strikes me about it, and uh, for disclosure, I am definitely a modernist who accepts much of postmodern conceptions of reality, which I think any rational person should. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the problem that I, I think you'd like to address, one of, one of the issues is, you have, as you cogently pointed out, you've got three potential responses to the conflicts and controversies that arise in recognizing that vested power is preserved by whoever has it. Uh, and in a fashion that discriminates against and 
compromises the ability of the out groups, whoever they be. But denial on the one hand and guilt, including reparations in my view, on the other, are just not functional ways, it seems to me, for a society to respond. Looking forward to the future, as you mentioned, and trying to repair and prevent perpetuation of discriminatory events is the functional basis. But that's, I'm puzzled by the amount of narrative that revolves around the first two as opposed to the third. I wish you'd comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think there is too much. Both guys have your credit cards warmed up. <laughs> Very good question. I'm really, I think the I, I agree. I'm a modernist with a lot with postmodern inclinations because it's reality. But the answer is, um, I don't think there's any benefit to guilt, and I don't think there's any benefit to um, what was the second I Reparation. Reparation. Okay, that's my personal opinion. Um, and I go back to Germany again. I, I studied in Germany. I was a German studies major. Uh, and I lived and worked in Germany with German professors in the government. So I understand. And they have they got an approach which I think is the appropriate approach. They've got a past that is both glorious in Germany and a past that has some true horror to it. They understand it. I, I admire the way they teach it. I admire the way they address it in the political system to try to ensure that minorities in Germany, including women, are represented in the Bundestag. Uh, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, for instance, guarantees certain things, that's their constitution. Um, they, those are tests, but they, uh, they recognize it and they try to address it because their country has lived with it. And when we deal with our major historical deficiency problem, slavery, um, I think we, it's appropriate to deal, in my opinion, with the same way. Not through guilt, not through trying to pay off, but simply recognize it and deal, understand what's going on in the future. And I think, in my opinion, that's what postmodernism is in the right approach. That's my opinion. So if that is in accord with what you think, then I think the same way. Which makes it correct, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask an easy one and then pass it on. Is critical race theory being taught in K through 12 schools? Um, and it, I don't know the answer to that. Because, as you know, education in this country is local. So it depends. Where are we talking about? Where, where are we talking about? I, you hear newspapers, and I talk to people. Some people say, yes, it is being taught. Some people in our district, some people say, it's no, it's not. Um, <laughs> I taught this at West Point. Um, I did get one letter, because there was an article written about me in my course. I got one letter from one alumnus who said I should be fired for teaching this. But that was only one person. Um, it, it is. How do you teach the Holocaust in Germany? Do you teach it to kindergarten kids? No. Okay. You teach it at an age appropriate level, and you teach it in a way that uh, there is a consensus among scholars and others. This is probably the best way to approach it, that kids can understand what happened without feeling guilt, but feeling responsibility for their country and their future. So I don't know. Um, I know it's being taught else place. I know it's a huge political issue. Um, I think the politics gets messes it up and messes our understanding of it up. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I know when I did this before, we had some teachers, retired teachers in the audience, and they had, yes, it was taught, no, it's not taught, but it's very localized. Doctor, thank you for your presentation. Can you give us an example or two of how pre-modern thinking assists us in any way in this country today? <laughs> it, it's a very good question. <laughs> Um, it's hard to be a pre-modern.
pre-modernist in this country. It's hard to be a pre-modernist in the world. Um, pre-modernism is based on some assumptions that I think are not true. It doesn't mean that there are some, not some values in pre-modern thinking. Uh, if you happen to be religious and believe in God, that's pre-modern. But that does not necessarily mean it's bad. It depends how you address it and how you use it in your life. Um, but by and large, we're living in a modern world with much, with, you know, with AI and with technology and everything happening so fast. We're evolving into a very much a postmodern world. And it's going to be tough to be a pre modernist in that type of a world. There was a very good book written about um, law in the United States. And what, what has happened is when change happens so fast, people can react one of two ways. They can either embrace it, like Madonna, they can embrace the technology, a lot of young people are doing that, or they can say, this is frightening, I can't cope with this, where are the values, where are the old fashioned, and they retreat back. And that's, to my opinion, why today, in this era, we kind of get a split between some real conservative, and I don't mean that in a conservative in a negative way, but going back to pre-modern fundamental thinking or embracing the future. And it's sometimes kind of hard to be right in the middle. So the short answer to your question is I can't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Howard Underwood from Amelia. Um, I would like to answer the critical race theory question. Um, yes, not by that name. Critical race theory is never, or hardly ever, under that name. But this concept that's up there on the screen right now, the idea that uh, you need to look beyond uh, the facial uh, neutrality of laws and that kind of thing, the idea that power is being corrupted and is used and that there are in-groups and out-groups and that, of course, that's being taught K through 12. so I'll try to address it. Um, of course, I do not know every country in the world. Um, most countries in the world uh, have a very tough time with pluralism, and a very tough time with integrating out groups and sharing power. Um, besides Germany, the other country I'm familiar with is Denmark, uh, because my nephew is married to a Danish woman. I was in Denmark for several weeks last year. Um, and I'm good friends with the uh, Danish general who heads the NATO forces in the Baltic right now. Uh, so my experience in Denmark was they are doing an extremely good job of maintaining a functioning, effective parliamentary government system while incorporating refugees, out groups, educating them um, with a very low level of corruption, a very low level of overt racism. Um, so and it's a small country, so it may be much easier to do it in a country like that. But Denmark is not just a pure homogeneous country anymore, but they're doing a very good job. So it certainly is possible, uh, but of course, every country is different in terms of size and, and so forth. Uh, and 
other countries, uh, you know, Japan is notoriously ethnically difficult to integrate into, and we know what happened in World War II is um, with the way the Japanese treated the Koreans and the Chinese who were seen basically as subhuman. Um, so yes, and in Africa that's true. Uh, I teach a lot about the Middle East. My wife is Iranian, um, so I know a lot about that. Um, it is, uh, it's very tough because they are being forced into a world that is increasingly modern and postmodern with a lot of pre-modern, you know, I'll use the term baggage, that, that is coming along with them. So I think the short answer to the first part of your question is it's very tough to do. I don't think many countries are doing it well. Denmark's doing it well. Germany is, tends to be Northern Europe. Uh, that <coughs> kind of need to, for various reasons. The second part of your, uh, was uh, whether the foreign threat would bring a country together. Uh, I worked with NATO for 10 years in Germany, that was my job. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think the devastation of Germany after the Second World War, in a sense, made that country look back on, it, on what had happened, whereas Japan didn't do quite that job. You know, there was certainly the devastation of the, the atomic bombs, but it was a different scenario. So I think it can, a, a crisis can bring people together, uh, but how it lasts, or whether it lasts, is, is, is tough to do. It's tough to do. Back here on the left. Hi, I'm uh, Tom, I'm a snowbird uh, from Detroit. So I, this is great, um, but social structures, power structures are a necessity in any society, right? Uh, without them, there's anarchy. So you kind of have to have them, I think. You talked about the evolution of, you know, pre-modern, modern, postmodern. Post it's a Darwinian approach to evolution of societal structures. There's often a thought of throw everything out from the past and start new with this evolution, but even in pre-modern, I'm sure there's things that are good, is modern and, and now. So it's kind of a thought I have, I like your perspective on that. And then the other question I have is what's the gimbal? What's the point of reference that says, as we're evolving these social structures, what is good and what is bad within those evolutionary progress that we make? Yeah. Um, these are not clear-cut delineations. There is no dividing line between pre-modern, pro I, I mentioned the Enlightenment as sort of the introduction of modern thinking. And these are intellectual trends. And there can be a difference between a social trend and a political trend and an intellectual trend. As I said, most people don't think of themselves, wake up in the morning and say, I'm a postmodernist. thank goodness for that. Um, so it's blurred. It's blurred. Um, you can you can have modern inklings. You can be postmodern. You can understand postmodernism and accept a lot of the tenets, but be very modern in your outlook. Have a lot of faith in science and progress and so forth. So, it, it, in the studies and all the readings I've done so forth, most scholars would say, yeah, it's this is an intellectual trend with increasing postmodernism into intellectual thought and therefore it filters down into society, but at various levels of society and to a different depth in various different societies. Um, you know, Iran again is a very traditional society. If you talk to the urban intellectual elite in Taiwan, you're gonna get a whole different outlook on life than a villager out in Shiraz or someplace like that. So it, it's, it's a mishmash of things. The second part of your question was, is there Francis Fukuyama, when he wrote his two volumes, The Origins of Political Order and The Decline of Political Order, 
how political orders and societies develop. There are certain common trends, but every country and every region is unique. China developed a, a modern society well before anybody else. Uh, Europe developed in a different way than Latin America for various reasons, colonialization and all of that. So I think my short answer to your question is, I don't think there is a metric, or I think, I think it's gonna be very specific to different societies because of their his history and their traditions. And some are gonna move faster, some are gonna move less, some may retreat. So I don't have a, a universal metric. I think it's too specific. Mark, thank you very much for clarifying. <laughs>